Okay, welcome back to the story of Paul and Silas in a Philippian jail singing praise to God and hymns at midnight, rejoicing because they know they're in the center of God's will and they're worthy to suffer for Jesus' sake. And the story continues in verse number 16 of Acts, rather verse number 26 of Acts 16. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Now, uh, for such a long time when, uh, over the years as I read that, I always, uh, for some reason, I don't know why, just imagined that the earthquake was necessary. And you can understand earthquake shaking the prison so that locks that were locked, you know, break free and so forth, but chains that are on people don't get automatically shaken off by an earthquake, right? I mean, if you've got chains on your hands and there's an earthquake, those chains don't fall off. Earthquakes don't do that. And, and so the earthquake was not uh, a means to set people free. The earthquake was just for effect. Amen. For God to say, hey, uh, you, you, you've, uh, you, you've done the wrong thing putting my boys in prison here, and uh, I'm big, and I'm going to send a message that it's not nice to mess with God's people here. So let me just shake things a little bit. And while I shake things, I think I'll pop open some prison doors, and I think I'll unloosen everyone's chains as well, because I'm in the business of setting people free. You think you can lock people in the innermost prison and keep, you know, keep my people chained up if I don't want them chained up? No, sir, no way. And so God sends an earthquake and it shakes the prison house. And I have to believe that others felt it, within, at least within the vicinity of earthquakes. Earthquakes, in my understanding, are not just tiny localized to one building type earthquakes. Usually it shakes a whole city. I just wonder if the reverberation from that earthquake uh, caused a lot of rumbling in that whole city. But it had the desired effect, okay, uh, there in the jail. Verse number 27, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, well, right there, I mean, he, 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 what, what do prisoners do? When the doors are suddenly open, they run. And he's thinking, well, everyone's gone. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, which was really a rash thing, wasn't it? I mean, probably he um, was under author authorities that have told him that if anyone escapes, it'll cost your life. Um, because that's a way of motivating people not to take bribes you know, from prisoners or, or their relatives outside the prison. Anyone gets out of here, you pay with your life. And that was kind of a Roman way of doing things, right? Remember when Jesus resurrected, the Roman soldiers that were guarding his tomb were, were put on trial and, and they were carted away. And, and, and scripture implies that they lost their lives. They were executed because they let a dead body get away, okay? But goodness, the, the jailer, maybe again in the darkness and maybe he was, of course, asleep at that time and didn't, didn't have his full sensibilities, didn't have it all figured out yet about the earthquake um, being the reason uh, behind these doors opening because um, he could have had a good excuse. Hey, how can I you know, keep prison doors closed? I didn't build the prison. If there's an earthquake and prison doors all open up, Prisoners escape, and not everyone necessarily was in chains, although it does say everyone's chains were unfastened. Yet, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison door open. So uh, again, I, I don't know how much more we can read into this, but let's keep on reading in verse number 27. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, and you have to even wonder if this was like prophetic, I mean, speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. How did Paul see? Paul was in the, locked in the inner prison. Was this jailer staying in that same local vicinity or was he further out? I don't know. It was dark. It was midnight. You know, um, there's no light yet. I mean, because the jailer in the next verse calls for a light. And so this could have been supernatural. Paul thinking to him, maybe he heard the jailer crying out, Oh God, you know. I'm going to kill myself or receive me or whatever. But, but he, he says, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Verse 29, and he called for lights and rushed in. So he wasn't in the very close proximity, but he rushes in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
Again, there's a lot of missing details there, obviously. I wish we had all the details as to what happened, but this jailer got the message. He knew there was a correlation between what had happened and Paul and Silas. Uh, I'm assuming he heard them singing praises to God and made a connection, you know, between what had happened. Um, and goodness, he knew it was supernatural when he saw them there without any chains on them and their feet had been unfastened and so forth, and he falls down before them. Well, he brings them out and he asks them the, the question that everybody should be asking all around the world, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What could be more important than that? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Isn't that good? So there's the gospel. Paul, of course, didn't say, well, you need to get circumcised. <laughs> you know, need to start keeping the law of Moses. No, no. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And surely, you know, this jailer knew why those guys were in there. They'd cast a demon out of a little girl that used to, you know, have a spirit of divination. And, uh, you know, he would have been wise to that, surely. He heard these guys singing praise to Jesus. And he knew that they were obviously devoted to Jesus. And so this was sufficient, although it might have been much more detailed. Luke doesn't tell us every detail. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And I want to close this segment by focusing in on that very important aspect. It wasn't accept Jesus as your personal Savior. You hear me? That's what people say today, but that's unbiblical. Jesus does not need your acceptance. You need his acceptance. The only way for you to be accepted by Jesus is to believe in him as Lord. And of course, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will repent of, you, of what you are doing that you know displeases him, and you'll endeavor to begin to serve him because you know you're going to stand before him and one day give an account. And if anyone will do that, they'll be saved. But if you will not do that, you won't be saved. If you accept Jesus as your Savior, you won't be saved. See you next time. Heavenward 7 is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.